It's time for our inaugural fitness forecast, a special edition of the All Things Fitness and Wellness podcast. I'm your host, Chrissy Van, and in this episode, you're going to be learning from some industry powerhouses. It's an exciting time for fitness business when it comes to innovation and massive growth opportunities. Our panel as we head into 2024 is going to dive into all things finance, trends to watch, where to invest, the latest in technology, and we're going to round out the conversation with the discussion around the convergence of health club and healthcare. But before we get started and introduce our panel, and it is an epic lineup, I want to say a massive thank you to our sponsor of the Quarterly Fitness Forecast. Big shout out goes to our friends at ABC Fitness. With more than 31,000 clubs and studios, 542,000 coaches and trainers, and 38 million members in over 100 countries, ABC Fitness is the fit tech provider to the best in fitness. Visit them at abcfitness.com. All right, let's get to it. Be sure to hit like and subscribe. This is ATFW. First of all, I'm highly impressed that not one of you is joining me through screen and Zoom. So bravo, all of us. <laughs> to have all of us gathered in this room for our very first fitness forecast is really exciting. So through this episode, we're going to be diving into some of the latest trends, what we're really going to be getting insights is the financial landscape right now in the fitness industry, which we know we've entered some volatile times. What does that mean for investors? And then we're really gonna be talking about some of the transitions we're seeing in regards to that collaboration between fitness and healthcare, because we are broadcasting from the Fitness Technology Summit in this moment. And I know that's exactly what the umbrella has been throughout the seminars. So first of all, it's a podcast and people are joining us by ear. So although you have familiar faces, I'm going to have you each introduce yourself, say your first name, where you're from, and then I want to know if you were stranded on a small desert island, what is the one piece of fitness equipment that you would bring and why? Yeah, I'll start. Uh, Chris Smith, President and CEO of Fitness World Canada. If I only had one thing, I think I would bring a 32 kilo kettlebell. That is very specific. <laughs> why? Now I got to know why that weight. <laughs> That's a very versatile piece of equipment. There's a lot of things I can do with that in terms of goblet squats and you know split squats. Not to mention the swings, the cleans, the snatches, everything in between. So it's just very versatile. All right, that was impressive logic to have that question and sprung on it you. It serves as an anchor weight when I build my raft. Oh, forward thinking. There yes. we go. That, and that is why you have the title of CEO. You know the the forward projections there. How about yourself, Mark? Mark Mastro, chairman of uh, New Evolution Ventures, based in the U.S. Of course. And the one piece of equipment, I mean, I might bring Wilson, I'm not sure. Yeah. There's a good chance you know, if you kick Classic. that around the island. Yeah. Um, probably a, a TRX would be a, a good piece to have so I could do a multiple exercises off of uh, palm trees, hopefully if they're on the desert island. Uh, but something that was pretty versatile in that way. All right, that's fair assessment. How about yourself, Bill? Yeah. Bill Davis, uh, I am uh, president and CEO of ABC Fitness. TRX was the one thought I had, but uh, uh, to go slightly different, I probably would actually bring a treadmill. I'm an avid runner, and if I'm on an island, um, you know, just the opportunity to have that uh, steady, steady surface. Well, as long as you got power. That's right. As long as, well, I assume solar. Solar. Yeah, solar, so solar treadmill. Solar coming. treadmill, yeah. <laughs> you know, I knew you were going to pick that. We joined ourselves we in did. the gym to the, yeah, the other did. day. And I did say small desert island, so laps wasn't going to work. That's right. That's right. That's right. Well, I myself, if anyone's curious, Chrissy Van, your host here, and I would just go for a row machine merely because it's ironic. I could see the news headlines after being like, oh, she had the rower, but could go nowhere. So the irony, I think would be worth it. Be prepared to go out to sea <laughs> and right. take your little coconut <laughs> boat on the way out. Makes sense. Yeah, exactly. Well, we're going to start off with some of the emerging trends and I'm going to kick it off with you, Mark, from an investor's perspective. What are some of the things that are exciting you right now? Depends where you want to focus. If you want to focus on brick and mortar, or you want to focus on tech or franchise, global, domestic, uh, it just depends on where your appetite is. But there's a lot of roll-up opportunity, I think, right now in the industry where you can take concepts and put them together and amalgamate. Uh, you've got several public companies right now that are performing pretty well and more to come, I think. And you've got a lot of people in the low cost sector, you know, the HVLP sector, as they call it. So from the standpoint of where do you go, I think it's, you know, what's your oyster? What are you excited about? Where do you want to spend time? What are you passionate about? And then how do you want to get after it? But I do think the global markets are, are even more exciting than the domestic markets in the U.S., in my opinion. And where particularly globally? 
I mean, expanding everywhere. I think South America is still wide open. There's some great brands doing good work down there, coming out of Brazil and Colombia, you know, South America. Uh, Alex Wiesner's platform in Santiago, Chile is outstanding as well. So I think there's a big opportunity there. Um, Africa is still unchartered for a lot of folks. Asia is still rebounding from the pandemic and has some work to do to kind of get back to where it was. Europe's got some amazing brands growing extremely fast. A basic fit, I mean, could open five or 600 units in the next year or two. So a lot of exciting things happening within the industry globally. And Chris, obviously you operate brick and mortar gyms. So what are you seeing from the trends perspective? Well, I mean, we've continued to see a shift into strength, but at the same time, you're looking at technology, you know, from a tech stack perspective. So just the integration of that, trying to create moments for members just to make it as easy and simple as possible um, to come into the clubs. And I think that's the recipe, right? How can we, you know, continue as an industry to get more people moving, um, more people, you know, being active and, and living active lifestyles for all the benefits that, you know, everyone's so familiar with. Yeah, it's really about making it approachable for the consumer because I know there's huge opportunity there when we look at the statistics and the narrative shift is well underway, which is really exciting. Bill, how do you kind of support these trends and what are you seeing from that technology perspective? I, I would echo the, the growth opportunities that uh, Mark mentioned. Um, from a technology perspective, it really is uh, geared towards creating increasingly frictionless experience because you know they are uh, consuming technology and everything they do outside the fitness you know world. The expectation is that that naturally translates, and so the opportunity to um, properly integrate the technology. And the other trend is the, the reality that you know many folks developed habits through the pandemic that were outside the brick and mortar club. And they're looking for that integrated experience to be able to capture what they're doing outside the club as well as what they're doing inside the club. Well, Bill, you kind of translated beautifully into my next question because exactly that I know for Chris and Mark, the last time you joined me on the podcast was about a year ago. And at that time, a lot of the discussion was really about this post-pandemic era. And when we look at trends, I mean, I know that you reference strength training. We know that that has evolved greatly, a lot more gym dedicated space for that. Another one would be connected fitness. And then through the year, I mean, we've seen what happened recently with Lululemon Mirror. We look at the shifts in Peloton as well. So what trends are kind of here to stay and what are others that we may see fizzle out? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, if we try to predict where we're going to be a year or two from now, I think all of us would be wrong um, as best as we would try to predict it. So even with the rise of Peloton, uh, and what we saw there and then the obvious, you know, challenges that they faced coming out of the pandemic, you know, again, I don't think the rise nor the fall was predicted to be exactly what it was. I do think that we'll just continue to see constant evolution and change. I do think it's an industry that is pushing forward, um, you know, in terms of back to the frictionless and what the technology companies are working to achieve and working with operators to really solve problems, which is, I think, what really, if anything, I would say has changed. There is a bit of a shift there where historically I would say technology companies had their you know one year, three year, five year roadmap. They were working on their you know plan, if you will, versus like what, what challenges the customer actually have and how are we solving those problems? So I would just say there's been a bit of a shift in the technology companies as a whole that I've seen in the last, call it 12 months, where that's how I feel that there's just more collaboration now, which ultimately is gonna be better for, for everyone. Well, and on that topic, obviously, everyone is talking about AI. I don't think anyone is not familiar. And most of the time when I hear it referenced from the fitness perspective, it tends to be about, I mean, we know we saw staffing shortages, for example. So kind of that virtual assistance, follow up with your clients, a relationship with building with your clients. Are there any other trends in the AI space that you think, and maybe Bill, you can jump yeah, on this? I think, I, I think you could think about the whole um, experience and every aspect, there's opportunity to leverage AI. I think about uh, new member acquisition and getting more sophisticated in the ways in which you're uh, targeting and, and, and securing um, ideal you know, membership to, the, again, the experience and how you personalize that experience for that uh, member to uh, retention strategies. And I would even go so far as you know, billing and support services, all of which have opportunity to leverage you know, AI and machine learning, which is uh, areas, all of those are areas that we're, you know, doing smart experimentation around. The conversation continues, but before we move along, a big thank you to our sponsor, ABC Fitness. 
Discover ABC Ignite gym management software and learn why it's the trusted solution for more than 8,000 clubs and 24 million members. Learn more at abcfitness.com. Well, I know at All Things Fitness and Wellness, we like to keep it a little bit out of the box. So you have all spent a lot of time in this industry. Before we move on to finance focus, I'm curious, what is a trend that you have seen in your career that really made your head scratch? Maybe it was a certain product or something in that realm where you went, what were they quite thinking? (laughs) That's an endless one. Uh, I think in the early days we used to, you know, get a kick out of kind of key card machine, you know, tracking. So, you know, folks would come in and say, I'm going to sell you a line of exercise equipment. And in this equipment, you're going to have your members track everything they're doing on that equipment and get feedback and information back on what they're going to achieve and what they're achieving, which sounded great. And you put it in your facilities and the members just didn't use it, didn't like it, forgot their card, didn't want to track it. And there's still companies doing that today, some successfully, some not. But that, that used to always be a big head scratcher for a long period of time. Then we had talking equipment. You know, there used to be exercise equipment that showed up that would talk to you and speak to you and motivate you and help you work out. And that lasted about a year or two before that kind of came and went. That was a head scratcher because, you know, people didn't want to be spoken to when they were working out. They wanted no, to motivate no. themselves. You know, that. <laughs> and then you've got hundreds of different types of group exercise classes that have shown up and kind of came and went that, you know, were not long term and they're short term. Um, lighting and then facilities and you know parts of your facilities that people liked or didn't like we can go on and on and on but depending on who you talk to um, the the head scratchers are always the ones you're not sure they're gonna work but a lot of them have so you know you just don't know I think when um, Planet Fitness came out and said we're just gonna do ten dollars you know a month for every club we have everybody scratched their head pretty hard but they made it very successful because they got high volume And a lot of people in the door and were able to keep their costs way down. So they had a pretty good working model, provided that their rent was reasonable. Uh, It was tougher to work in the high rent markets, you know, urban areas like New York or Chicago. But it worked really well in the suburban areas. So everything is kind of, you know, it it ebbs and flows with, uh, you know, what you might think is interesting or not interesting. That's fair. And if nobody had an out-of-box idea, then we would never evolve. I know, Chris, I can tell by your face there's something in your mind here that you've seen where you're like... <laughs> well, there, there's a lot of things. I mean, I don't even know the name of it, and I don't think I would want to name the brand, but just some of the stuff I see people do that's just what I would call really gimmicky, right? So it's the, the new lotion and the new this and that, and if you put it on, you'll sweat more, and by sweating more, you're going to lose weight more. And literally has nothing to do with the law of thermogenics, if you will, which is actually what would you know, effectively create weight loss or calorie management, those sort of things. So just a lot of those different gimmicky things are always the things I kind of scratch my head on because, you know, those are things people come up and ask me about. What do you think of this product? And I'm like, what are you doing? But, you know, again, without new ideas, you know, you wouldn't eventually evolve and grow. So, you know, there's a place for everything, I suppose. Yeah, you don't know till you try. My mind immediately went to spandex, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, Lululemon's done, done very well with that. Well, but it was a little bit of a head scratcher <laughs> initially. But in all seriousness, the, the one trend, and I find myself in this conversation a lot lately, is access to clubs. And many clubs are talking about turnstiles and gates. And, all the, and I'm sitting here thinking to myself, you know, with the technology that's available today in this notion of a truly a frictionless, you know, experience, there's opportunities to to do that in a much more friendly, I dare say, less restrictive uh, manner. And and again, something that we're, we're certainly promoting you know, for people to consider. So that's that that's a head scratcher for me. Fair enough. Well, we know when it comes to the financial landscape. Things have changed a little bit over the last while. Mark, to kind of kick things off here, I know you spoke about some of the trends when it came to opportunities globally, but what's the current financial landscape like from an investment perspective for people that are looking to expand their reach in this sector? There's a tremendous amount of capital available and kind of on the sidelines, as they say, looking to invest around concepts that are proven and have good, strong cash flow dynamics. I think the one, two, three, five million dollar EBITDA type companies are still not big enough to attract, call it venture capital, um, maybe home office and smaller capital players who come in there. But the north of 10 to 20 million, you know, cash flow type companies have tremendous uh, traction power right now. People are looking at the industry. It's recovered dramatically from the pandemic. And I think there's a lot of opportunity out there, depending on, you know, where it is your aspirations lie. If you are looking to sell and move on, or if you're looking to raise capital to grow and, you know, give up a little bit of equity to do so. 
Well, and Chris, you've been in a growth trajectory the last while. So when you're looking at clubs, what are kind of the top three to five things that you're specifically looking for if you're planning on making an acquisition? Well, I mean, some of the things that Mark was just talking to, but it's the overall health of the business, right? I mean, oftentimes in a uh, acquisition transaction, something to that effect, you know, sometimes those businesses are struggling and that's why they're obviously looking to to exit. So I'm typically looking for something that's not doing that, where it's just a different transition scenario where someone's ready to move on for whatever reasons that might be. But yeah, strong business case, strong cash flow, good members, you know, good equipment, a nice club. And we're still going to go in and do our thing and then from a branding perspective and make it our own and, and do those sorts of things. Let's just make sure it's sound. Yeah. And for you, Bill, obviously in the technology sector, how have things kind of changed for you? What we're seeing in terms of our customer base is, is that we're, I'd say, in a lower interest rate environment, they were very committed to organic growth, that they were going to build the clubs, they were going to um, expand um, really independently. And what we're witnessing is more and more appetite for consolidation. So in lieu of building, buying. And, and so I would expect that will uh, is a trend that will naturally uh, continue. But from an investment perspective, from a technology point of view, you, you touched on it. We're, we're being asked increasingly, how can we help with the labor challenges? Um, how can technology be more effectively utilized to, again, create or streamline processes that uh, minimize you know, dependency on, uh, on human capital? You have a couple of things going on you now that Bill pushes forth here that first is the cost of construction has gone up dramatically. The time to develop and build has gone up dramatically. What we used to be able to, you know, find a location, sign a lease, and build that product within seven to eight months. Now it can be anywhere from 13 to 15 months or longer. So it's taking longer, it's more expensive, and it's more difficult. And then you've got a competitive landscape with a lot of folks that are out there, you know, dropping their pricing to get into the HVLP bracket to compete with those that are there, making it more difficult to, you know, kind of survive in the market if you've got a bunch of people around you at 10 to $20. And then you've got a lot of boutiques out there that are continuing to enter and, and leave and move back and forth. So as a, an owner operator, a lot of times it might be easier to acquire and amalgamate versus build. So that's kind of the piece you have going on there. And then on the other side is, as Bill alludes to, is technology. So technology is getting better and better and better. So you've got this, I call it streaming effect where you know the folks like Disney and Amazon and Netflix are saying enough of people using the same account with their family and friends. We gotta find a way to better control and ring fence everybody. And the same thing happens in our gym space where you know people are coming in using other people's cards. And right. some of us have good good ways to you know alleviate that, others don't. So I could take my kids and my 22 year old can say, I can walk in any gym in the country for free anytime I want because I'll never have any kind of a system that stops me. And there's a few clubs that can, but he's probably right. So we've either got to come up with a better system and, and get, you know, whether it's Gates or Palm or something that I, technology people let you do it. So when you enter the facility, you can be controlled. Uh, otherwise, you know, we run into this issue where probably 15 to 20% of the member base is not paying or doesn't belong. And so those are things that technology eventually <clears throat> will help us cure. And then the reporting suites, uh, especially what ABC's done and developed and, and others is awesome. And the more information we get from the data that we have about our members to predict, I mean, the holy grail is what's the day they're planning to leave and why and how can we alleviate that so our retention can go up. And then on a consumer side, how do we figure out when that consumer is really deciding to join a gym and how do we become the gym they want to join? So all those things <clears throat> on the technology piece is, a, is kind of the holy grail, as I call it, as we move forward. Yeah, well, and there's a lot of data there because everyone's adapting. I mean, I know even in the my own gym landscape, you just switched to having everything in your phone. Although you brought up such a good point because I just saw a TikTok that unfortunately was very viral and I won't name what gym it was, but they were using, they challenged themselves every day to use a different product to scan into the gym and it was working whether it was like a bushel of blueberries, a salad the next day. Uh, so unfortunately, that type of narrative is traveling as well. I think a lot of people have good morals, but not ideal. So it is important to have those kind of things in place. You, you look very disappointed hearing this. No, I mean, it's the reality. I mean, we see it every day. And so, yeah, having those measures in place and even just, you know, in particular, I mean, as an operator, we all have a responsibility on member safety. Mm -hmm. So making sure that those that are supposed to be there are the ones that are there. Um, those that are, you know, current in their dues and, and all those sorts of things. So it's definitely an area of an opportunity for the industry.
Definitely. We're recording really at the cusp of Q3 results coming in. So we know within the last quarter, there were a couple announcements that were surprising. Planet Fitness Shift comes to mind. Uh, obviously, we saw what happened with Mirror and the connected fitness space. When you reflect on some of those announcements, what kind of came to your attention the most? Well, we've observed, you know, really, quite honestly, since 2020 is unprecedented uh, membership growth. So we've actually, um, and I have this conversation with our private equity owner quite often, you know, how, how sustainable of what we've observed these past three years from a membership growth, you know, should we bank on or count on? Um, and, and from across our customer base, it's literally been almost 2x, that of pre-pandemic levels. And I think the industry as a whole is, you know, really evaluating their ability to increase price, think about different uh, membership type models that uh, not only introduce more flexibility, but you know, ultimately optimize revenue. So those are the two dynamics that I think uh, bode well for the industry in the near term. I and mean, anytime you see you know change or shifts and whether it's publicly traded or private companies, I mean, there's always going to be constant change, right? I've already said that a couple of times, but I do think it's true. Uh, when we look at the landscape and look at the space and, and the, you know, the shifting of markets and investments and, and what that looks like. So you know, I mean, at the end of the day, I think everyone's got to do their fiduciary responsibilities and satisfy their shareholders, their customers, their constituents, and all these things to do what's best for these businesses. So I think that's why we're seeing some shifts and some changes in the industry. And then, you know, some of the individuals that have led some of these businesses have had incredible runs. I mean, historical in many, many ways. Uh, and so certainly uh, nothing but, you know, I would think pride and joy as they're able to reflect back on the journeys that they've had. So, you know, when I look at the landscape and I read, you know, the different reports that come out on financials and different groups, again, whether it be pu public or private transactions, what I would say is back to even what Mark was talking about, you know, earlier is the appetite is very strong. Both, I would even say, yes, globally, certainly, but even from a North American perspective, I think there's a lot of, you know, groups looking for ways to get involved in our industry a lot because of what Bill was talking about, right? That we're seeing double digit growth and we're seeing all this growth in the industry. So the industry I think is as healthier now or healthier than it's ever been. And again, we're in a climate right now where we've got some, you know, some challenges globally. Uh, there's some things going around the world that continue to make things a challenge. And even with all of that, the industry continues to push forward in, in a very strong way. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of opportunity there. And I know we're going to be speaking about it later in the podcast, but I think as well that intersection of healthcare yeah. is really going to have such a strong impact on that. But first, we're going to chat a little bit more about technology. I know that we have obviously covered it a little bit in trends because you can't help but talk about the fitness industry and marry technology there. But from an investment perspective, what are some of the particular elements that are looking very attractive? Well, obviously, I'm biased. <laughs> I, I think okay, I think I'm club management. I think club management is the place to be. But um, Mark touched on it earlier. You know what we're witnessing is the the, the tools and capabilities that just improve insight and and really giving you first ever you know ability to have on-demand uh, capability of what your business is doing how predictive you are around member acquisition through retention and the programming its efficacy and all of that you know is an area that I think is uh, just at its infancy and, and a lot of money and a lot of interest is uh, is absolutely being pointed there in terms of insights and overall reporting. We're going to take a moment to thank our sponsor of the quarterly fitness forecast, ABC Fitness. Whether an expansive multi-location enterprise or a boutique club, ABC Ignite optimizes every aspect of your gym, enabling your team to deliver exceptional experiences to members. Visit them at abcfitness.com to learn more. Well, before we move on from technology, can you imagine if as humans we could build in an upgrade? So I want to know if you could have one fitness superpower, super strength, super flexibility, or super speed, what would you choose and how would you use it in your daily life? I feel like you're biased because I know you've broken machines with strength. It's I true. Heard. <laughs> I have broken a couple machines, so I don't need the strength superpower. I, I was already gifted that. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and take some flexibility. Because as I age, 
uh, and I continue to work on that, you know, component. I, I, there are many times when I'm stretching, I wish I was just a little more flexible. A little Gumby-like, you know, a little flexibility. I, I wish I was a little Gumby-like. I'm not. I think flexibility is definitely on top of the list as, as you kind of get a little bit older. It's super important. But I also think that knowledge is the kind of quest that we're all after. I'd love to have the ability to really understand the human body, the makeup of the body, and the, the needs of the body as we kind of move forward both mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, all areas. That, that'd be where I would want to focus. To be unique, I would, say, I would say speed. And I think about it just from the context of just how rapidly things are evolving and ability to keep pace, um, but in some respects, try to get ahead of it and anticipate. And you know, so I would, uh, I would lean towards speed. The thing about the old days where we mag striped in and waited 10 <laughs> seconds to say, yep, you're a member, come on in, versus today, it's like it's instantaneous. instantaneous. <laughs> It still yeah. hasn't confirmed you've paid, but <laughs> we, we trust you. <laughs> we were flexible then. Well, I mean, if anybody knows me or follows me, that's also my issue. Karaoke, it's my Olympic sport, and I 100% could have used some flexibility. Cause did, torn. You, did you ever tell the, the audience what you did to your hamstring, how you tore it? No, nope, I sure didn't. Are you trying to keep that private? Well, you know, there's no shame in that game. The it's been a over. long sports Chrissy recovery. Chrissy tore her hamstring doing karaoke. Oh, my God. Nice. I did. It, this is why I say karaoke is the Olympic sport. Very enthusiastic. What I thought. What were you singing? It, it was ABBA, Gimme, Gimme, or Money, Money, Money. There you go. <laughs> which, very fitting, since we've been talking about finance. But, mm. yes, I for what I lack in vocals, I thought I would do with dance. And I learned that I'm no longer a competitive cheerleader. And you should not drop into the splits. <laughs> so, full tear at the proximal. Significant tear <laughs> at the distal. And when it talks about being committed to your gym spaces, it has been a very important part of my rehabilitation. Yes, yes. <laughs> You know, what can you do? So I need that superpower. Uh, kind of leads us into the healthcare system because I have to say in Canada, it personally wasn't very helpful to me through that journey. And I think more and more, our spaces when it comes to brick and mortar gyms are becoming very important in that space. So let's talk about this intersection of fitness and healthcare. If you're investing dollars in that space, there seems to be a lot of exciting up and coming. So what are those right now that you're seeing where you're like, this is a huge shift in opportunity? I mean, I think we all could opine on this for sure. But I think, you know, from a U.S. perspective, and again, you know, I live in the U.S., U.S. citizen, but I've been in Canada now for 13 years. I uh, love both countries, truthfully. You know, with the FIT Act and what U.S. is doing and with what all, you know, Congress and the Senate uh, with Liz Clark, you know, the president CEO of URSA, and all the initiatives they, that they're doing, uh, the work that they even did again with the, on the Capitol is tremendous if they can get the FIT Act passed, which is certainly a huge focus um, for, you know, getting more people moving, right, and getting families able to have access to meaningful dollars to help their kids be active, which, again, we have a childhood obesity epidemic. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at military readiness. I mean, the list goes on and on in terms of why it makes sense and why, you know, the FIT Act would be good for America. Uh, in Canada, in particular, uh, we already have a tax line on the actual tax form. It's just a matter of a simple shift, uh, again, from a federal government perspective, where we need Ottawa to kind of act on behalf of the Canadian citizens to just, again, enable more people to have access uh, to exercise and facilities and movement and sports programs for kids and all those things. So there's a couple of things there. And I think, you know, the argument is really simple in terms of why it's good for us. So it's trying to figure out who's arguing against that. Like who, who would have financial interest to lobby against said bills and figuring out which companies and organizations and groups might stand in the way of that. Because I don't think anyone can argue at this point with the amount of research and studies and everything that's been done on wellness and well-being, fitness, healthcare, all of it, to know that movement, right, and exercise is 100% the answer to so many things that we have that are challenging us as a society today. I agree with all of that so much. It's why I'm sitting in this chair and left my career completely because of how much I agree with that. I think the answer to your question is there's a lot of people that profit off of sick care, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. And I think that's why you, there is a massive conflict. And I think that's where, I mean, we kind of jumped ahead because I want to talk about advocacy, but I think that's why the unified voice right now is so important. And I think post pandemic, from what I understand within the industry, that's happened more and more, but you kind of need to get everyone together championing this and not just from the upper levels, your members need to know 
and be advocating for this as well. Two points. What Chris was talking about, I think it's really important to emphasize that it's not just physical. We're talking about mental health as yes. well. So it's both both dimensions. But I think, again, I spent 10 plus years in the healthcare industry, um, in healthcare IT. And as you pointed out, there is, there is absolutely constituents that profit from sick care, but there's also a payer community that wants to determine how cost is driven down. And, and so I think a, a fundamental trend that we all should be sensitive to is that increasingly payers themselves and large employers are saying we will pay for preventative activity or, or pursuit. And so the whole paradigm um, in fact, can shift in terms of who's paying for membership and the like. And it's something, again, that as a, as a, as a provider, you know, we're anticipating. And a statistic that Liz Clark, uh, who Chris mentioned, you know, often cites that I think is really powerful is that every dollar that is spent on preventative saves $3 in sick care. And, and to me, that's just simple math and it makes a ton of sense. So the trend right now is GLP-1, right? So what's going to shape kind of the globe and kind of healthcare over the next one to five years is, you know, what, you know, you call these uh, shots to reduce uh, weight. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Govi, Ozempic, et cetera, if you're not familiar. So what's happening now is you've got a battle going on with the employee who wants the ability to have these shots so they can reduce weight. 25% of the body weight can come off in a short period of time. So they can lose 25 to 75 pounds through this program. And then the employer and the insurance companies who don't want to pay for it. The shots average around $1,000 a month or more. Could be a lot more, a little bit less. And so there's this battle going on. And then you have these two constituents out there. You have self-insured, which are some of the bigger employers. So they're self-insuring their, their you know, employee base. And then you've got the traditional insurance care programs that employers have. On the insurance care employ employers, they're going to the insurance company saying, I want this shot. And the insurance company saying, we're not giving it to you. It's not covered. So that's one battleground. On the you know, self-insured employee, they're going to the company saying, I want the shot. And they're like, uh, what do we do? Because our employees are beating us up. So that's going to be something that is the battleground for healthcare as we go forward. Because now it's a cure for, you know, call it obesity, morbid obesity, and potentially diabetes. And that's going to change the face of healthcare in the next, like I said, one to five years. And we can spend a lot of time talking about it, but there's gonna to need to be support. So there's a company out of London called iPrescribe or Exe that has, I think, very close to FDA approval that has software that allow people to get, you know, programming around, call it obesity, morbid obesity, and at the same time, uh, diabetes. And that's gonna funnel people into exercise, which is gonna funnel people into the gyms. And so I think there's going to be this massive potential wave because everything points towards um, this weight loss effectively also eating away at muscle and yes. muscle mass. Yeah. Yes. And if that is truly the case and that becomes the case, people are going to wake up and recognize that they need to do some kind of strength training, whether that's pushing themselves on a park bench or doing something at home digitally or getting into the island with Chris's 32-pound kettlebell. They're going to have to do something, 32-kilo kettlebell. They're going to have to do something to do some kind of strength resistance training, which should bode well for our industry as we talk about health care. That's such a fascinating point, too. And I think as well, the space is serving when you talk about the mental health aspect. Generally, I mean, anyone I've ever interviewed that's had a massive weight transformation, there's a lot of mental work that has to come with it. And I'll be very curious to see the studies around that as well, because when you have this rapid weight loss shift, your habits or mentalities around it may not have quite transformed with it. And I think that's where our spaces could really help people build those habits from that point forward. Kind of on that note, I know one of the big topics here at the Fitness Technology Summit was about bringing in different healthcare elements into gyms and working with certain hospitals and being part of their programming and getting referrals. So what are your thoughts on the evolution of that space? I mean, that, that's been there forever. So we've been doing that for 20, 30 years. And you know, hospitals get hung up on policy and they get hung up on personnel. And so when you get into that space, you say, we're going to provide these services, the hospitals and say, who's providing it? And what kind of training do they have? And what kind of accreditation do they have? And are they of quality? Otherwise, we can't send them to you. Right. And so that's where the buck kind of stops. 
So there's a potential there, but if you're going to truly get the referral from the hospital network or the healthcare providers, it's much more difficult than getting it from the doctor in the local office who will be happy to prescribe that. So it's a battleground that we've been facing for decades, and it's one of the toughest ones to, to win on because they really get hung up on you know, who's the trainer in the facility that's going to take them through that program and what's their you know, certifications and background. You know, again, the U.S. landscape's different than the Canadian landscape. So from just a purely Canadian perspective, you know, the province of British Columbia, we do exactly what Mark was kind of mentioning, which is we go direct to the doctors, right? So it's not necessarily the hospital's administration because you've got to build a relationship and establish some rapport and trust and all those things. And it's helping them understand that our trainers, you know, are you know, four-year degrees, they're registered kinesiologists, uh, some with physical therapy backgrounds, and help them really understand the educational continuum um, that, say, our trainers are on to then make sure they understand that, yeah, they are qualified to help individuals that are on a, you know, rehabilitation program, post-surgery, uh, all those types of things. But it's, it's really kind of a a hand-to-hand issue. It's not like, hey, let's go meet with the administration and see what they think, because that, for us, that's just been ineffective. But there are provinces, even in Canada, you know, Alberta is one of them, uh, where they've closed that bridge a lot more, where there's a lot more medical prescription um, directly into fitness facilities. And we do see that occasionally, um, you know, in, in our province. And then certainly in the U.S., there's some big groups that have, you know, started to, I think, really crack the code around the hospital administration. Um, but I do think that, they, you know, they spend a lot of time, energy, and money to do so, right? Um, and so it's out there, but it's definitely a, a challenging environment. Well, and I think the shift is so important, as we know, when it comes to fitness and the inactivity crisis, we're really just touching on this small population that is the dedicated consumer or the occasional, and there is tremendous opportunity in the remainder there. So this kind of touches into the technology side as well as preventative healthcare, but from a marketing perspective, and we know that digital media is such a tremendous tool to communicate with men members and spread a message. How have you been seeing things evolved or how have you been trying to evolve the language that you use to sh- chip away at that really ingrained notion of shredded abs, weight loss, like how do we get the members to really understand that this is a place where you actually not only can prevent chronic disease, you can expand your lifespan. Like this is an essential tool in our lives. It starts and ends for me around the messaging and the the, ben- the inherent benefits. In fact, you know, studies have been done that last year, you know, for the first time, the higher percentage of motivation around joining a gym was tied to wellness as opposed to fitness. And so I just think there's opportunity to continue to promote and celebrate the inherent benefits of physical activity, not to be shredded or, you know, to pursue a, a necessarily a particular look, but um, just overall, you know, mental and physical uh, well-being, you know, is is the overarching opportunity. So to me, it, it comes down to how effectively are we communicating. Have you changed your marketing strategies in the digital space? I think we're a little bit more conscious of, you know, the imagery that we're using and what that looks like, how that could be portrayed. Um, again, I think, you know, in today's marketplace, you know, when you talk about, you know, the big multifamily sport facilities, uh, luxury facilities, if you will, to your mainstream gyms, to your HVLP, to your boutique fitness. I mean, it's kind of like, well, what do you want for dinner tonight? And the family sits around the table and kind of decides. I think you can kind of sit around the table now and say, what kind of fitness do we want and where do we want to go? And I think it's important that everyone tries to be as accessible as possible. And then from there, I think using, again, technology, we're all trying to leverage is, again, using simple data points. But how can we help these people get in the club, get active and then stay active? Right. We want them to habituate themselves to activity in general, regardless of their background, regardless of their motivation, whether it be physical or mental. We just want them to stay because, again, the power of what it does for them is, you know, that, that, that much is concrete at this point from an evidence-based standpoint. We're taking a brief pause to thank our sponsor. This episode of the Quarterly Fitness Forecast is brought to you by ABC Fitness. ABC Ignite transforms fitness management, streamlining operations, enhancing revenue, and delivering profound insights. Built for innovative club operators, Ignite ensures efficiency and member-centric experiences. Learn more at abcfitness.com. Well, before we move on a little bit more about the advocacy, I think it's really important because you're all very accomplished in your professions 
to humanize you to another degree. So I'm curious in your career in this industry, what was your, oh my God, I can't believe I did that moment. Because I think we all have one on their journey where you're like, well, that maybe wasn't the right move. I have too many to list. Yeah. <laughs> too many to list of what I did. I mean, again, you grow older, but when I was younger, uh, you know, as a football player, grew up in sports, uh, certainly a, a passionate individual, always, always have been, but learning when to listen, right? And so just several times in my career where maybe I, I shouldn't have talked and I should have listened more and, you know, said things that probably either weren't true or I wasn't even that sincere about it, but just out of passion and or reaction. So it's been those moments in my career that, you know, I don't wish I could take back because you learn from them and you move forward and you grow. But certainly there's been times where I've said or, or done things that maybe I wish I could have done different. That was the great political answer. What's a good example? <laughs> What's a good example of that? Well, kettlebell. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I threw a, big regrets on that island. <laughs> well, I did upset one of my trainers once, truthfully, where he was wanting me to do bicep curls. And I explained to him, I don't do bicep curls. He's like, look at your arms. I said, I understand I have big arms. But I don't do bicep curls. I don't like single joint movements. I like big joint. And this guy was training me. So he handed me like an 80 pound bar to train. And I threw it across the gym. And with a lot of people witnessing Javelin. me throw an 80 pound, you know, barbell. And they're like, oh my gosh. Uh, it was a little shocking to people as I threw that. So, I mean, it kind of embarrassed the trainer. So I wish I wouldn't have done that to him. Wish I could take that back. But in the moment, I was really passionate about not wanting to do arm curls that day or ever. Yeah, apparently. He likes to toss things. That's why he likes the kettlebell. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> How about yourself, Mark? What's a moment you reflect on? It's just too many to, you know, I'm not the kind of person who goes back and looks a lot and says, oh, this or that. But there's a life balance piece that I always kind of focus on. And it's not easy to have that life balance when you're in our industry because our industry is a 24-7, 365 kind of business. I leave it to you to lead in with 24 where it all began. That's right. <laughs> so it's, a, it's kind of a, you know, every second, every day. But I would say being able to uh, enjoy the industry that I've been passionate about for a long period of time, but at the same time to be able to raise a family with my wife and four children, that's probably the aha moment. Like, how the hell did I get through that gauntlet? And, you know, a lot of it's my wife putting up with me and my kids, you know, allowing me to do what I do and have time for them. But that's probably a big component of kind of trying to keep that life balance and perspective um, around the path of success and failure you have on a daily basis. Yeah, it's definitely a constantly moving target to keep that balance as well. Always more balls being juggled. How about yourself, Bill? It's interesting Mark brought that up because I talk extensively about life balance and in, in its pursuit, um, really being passionate about what you do. And, and so I've always attempted throughout my career to identify and, and associate with those things that I'm passionate about and I can give my all you know, in terms of relative success. Um, at a bit more tactical level, when you first asked the question, the thought that came to mind is I was, early in my career as a manager, I did have an experience where I, I literally burned out one of the folks that were working for me. We were, we were, we were grinding it and working really, really hard. And it was a seminal moment just in terms of as a leader, you know, recognizing uh, the impact that we have, but um, just a, a greater self-awareness of empathy, the people that you're leading and, 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 you know, the responsibility you have in terms of uh, taking care of them and, uh, you know, recognizing that what is balanced for myself is different for everybody else. So. Was that something you recognized in the moment with them or more so? It was, it was a hard, hard lesson. Yeah. So, um, you know, internalized it immediately and, and took it upon myself to say, I don't want to ever feel that way or experience that because, you know, I felt very, very bad for that individual. And, um, and again, as a leader, you know, just recognizing the expectations that we have for ourselves and, and translating that to the expectations that, that we have for those that we lead. We all have missteps, right? And I think it's the learnings that come out of that is what matters the most. And that kind of transitions to me to what we are learning right now is the fact that we need to do more to advocate for our industry. Chris, you obviously touched on some of the efforts that are happening on the URSA side of things. We know that we're looking to get this message out. How, do, I mean, FIT's been around for so long. So it's like, how do we actually get there? Uh, it's called checkbooks. 
uh, people need to write more checks. So unfortunately, you know, as we went into the pandemic, just I think everyone was behind the idea of advocacy from a philosophical perspective, but from an actual belief system or putting your money where your mouth is, to be more frank, uh, there was just a lack of that, right? Which is why the industry was kind of caught flat footed as the pandemic, you know, arrived and hit and there just wasn't the audience or the appetite um, to be able to move things forward. And so I think that's what is different now. Uh, what I would say holistically, there are a, a large group of individuals that are doing just that and taking action and doing work on the Hill, as well as, you know, financially supporting those same activities uh, from a U.S. perspective. But there's still so much more that can be done. And there's so many more operators that still need to come to the table and participate in a meaningful way if they're, again, truly passionate about that. So, again, you know, an example would be the restaurant industry. All restaurants contribute, contribute to the restaurant industry. It doesn't matter scale, scope, size, whatever. They're all in it to win it. And it's why they're a very powerful uh, group when it comes to legislative efforts to kind of protect their industry. And so from a purely, you know, fitness industry perspective, we're not even close to that. Um, we're, we're barely, you know, kind of scratching the iceberg from a just a purely U.S. perspective on the involvement that ultimately will be required to collectively move people. Now, again, are, do people know who their congressman is? Do they know who their senators are? Uh, are they you know, calling them or writing letters to make sure they understand that they're a constituent who owns a business in their district? Who They need, work for them. <laughs> correct, right? They work for them. So there's all those things. From a Canadian perspective, FIC um, does a great job. Um, we're, I'm very proud of the work that actually Canada has accomplished, right? We're a, we're a small little country up there, call it 35 million people. But the work that Sarah Hodson and her team did, and now it's transfer, transferred over to Mr. Hardy as the executive director there on FIC. But Canada has a lot of big wins, um, where, again, I think even there's collaboration going on between FIC and some of the work at URSA for some of the wins that Canada has been able to get from an overall you know, government support of the industry. So there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of work being done. But there's more and more and more that I think needs to happen in order for all of us to kind of see the full vision come to fruition. And to educate anyone that's listening, just in case they're not familiar, FIT is the Personal Health Investment Today Act. You can use your H HSAs or FSAs, pre-tax dollars, that then could be allocated toward gym memberships, personal training, youth sports obviously being a big one. So that's really the big bill that they are looking to get pushed through. And I know it's more voices necessary, but on top of what it would do from a health perspective, which we know, as we say, we're in a physical inactivity crisis with massive repercussions and cost, when it comes to if it passes, Mark, there's most likely tremendous opportunity for the fitness industry as well. So from the growth side financially, what could we be looking at if we actually saw this passed for the industry, an industry that was exceptionally hurt during the pandemic? Yeah, well, there's, there's a couple of things to think about. So from an industry perspective, obviously it opens up more and more constituents to use facilities and whether they put it into the youth sports for their kids, whether they put it into a gym membership or a corporate membership, whatever they might do, that's fantastic. So I think from that standpoint, you know, it opens everybody's eyes to taking away another excuse. I don't wanna work out because uh, I don't have enough time. Uh, my wife, my husband won't let me. Oh, I can't afford it. I can't, I can't go to the gym, I just can't afford it. Well, now you can afford it, it eliminates one more objective. The laziness is the real factor, but ultimately, it's like anything else. You know, you know you probably shouldn't eat french fries every day, it's not good for you. You know you probably shouldn't eat a lot of meat because it's not good for you, but it tastes good, so you do. Uh, you're like, oh, I'll worry about it later, I'll take a drug, I'll be fine. But what I would do is, I, I think I would throw two ideas out while we're on here for the industry to think about. One is, to, to get the act to pass in the United States is Herculean because it's very difficult. But to get it to pass in Canada might be a lot easier. And I think they need to get it to pass someplace, Colombia, Canada, Germany, someplace to show as an example, it's been done and here's what's happened because of it, to put pressure on the U.S. Because the U.S. likes to lead and it hates to follow. And if somebody else is about to pass it, they might wake up and say, holy shit, they're going to beat us to it. The second thing is that the U.S. is, if you, as you've seen in the last kind of five years, the U.S. has decentralized. It used to be federal government policy that everybody would seek. But now that the Supreme Court is kind of pushing everything back to the states, it's become state. If I was sitting at URSA on the FIT Act with Chris and everybody, I'm not, but if I was, I would pinpoint the next up and coming presidents of the United States, whether you think it's Gavin Newsom or whoever it might be. And. I would try and get something passed in those states with those governors saying that, look, there's 40 million people in California. 
5 million of them belong to gyms. If you pass this act, you're going to get 5 million votes and you're going to be a hero. And when you go to the U.S. and become president, the whole country is going to want you to pass this act. Get in with the local state level, get something done there and set a, a precedent that somebody can carry to the White House. Those are the ways I would probably think about it as an alternative, because trying to get and herd all these cats in the U.S. to get to an ultimate answer, it could happen. But I don't know if it'll happen in my lifetime. Fair enough. And I know, Bill, you're very involved. So kind of how do you feel about that sentiment there? Well, I'm a bit more optimistic than Mark in the terms of its prospect. But that being said, if I digress just a little bit, you go back to the pandemic. The fact of the matter is the fitness industry was not well organized and as a consequence, not well understood in terms of its scale, its impact from an employer point of view. Uh, its impact from a wellness perspective, which we talked about extensively. So I think about the FIT Act, um, not only in terms of, I think it's sensible legislation, but um, it's a platform. And it's a platform for which it's given us an opportunity to have conversations. And I'm just, I marvel at the fact that we're sitting here with these legislators and they, they're just, they're limited to no knowledge in terms of the fitness industry as a whole. We're having conversations that quite candidly should have started 30 years ago. And, and so it's a platform that and I'm, I'm hopeful, you know, we leverage to think about, you know, how it becomes, you know, more relevant, more well understood. Yeah. And what you see is the politicians in office that sit in those seats are not fitness people. Yeah. So part of it is that they're an older population base. You know, our government's run by... Uh, centurions so we got a little bit of that but there's a younger base coming and when that base comes I think that's the one that'll maybe get behind this they'll be more knowledgeable have more information but we're constantly fighting with people and, and we and, and, and when Bill says we should have done this 30 years ago we were doing this 30 years ago um, Ray Wilson was doing it in the 60s yeah. and I can show you what he's got I mean he's been fighting it forever and ever and he was trying to pass bills in the state of California forever so it's been around a long time but it's just been very difficult for anybody to get behind it because they view it as a way that tax dollars are going to be lost to the government they view it as not important they don't really care and the healthcare folks would rather put a pill in you than send you to a gym where you can get healthier it, it, that's you mentioned earlier it's just that battle that we've had but at some point, somebody's going to wake up to all of this. And I think it's going to be led by the employers that are now self-insured. I think that's where we need to focus. We need to get in with those folks and those companies, because there's so many of them, and not try and get into the healthcare system. Let's just go to the folks that really need to reduce healthcare costs, which is self-insured employers. Focus there. The conversation continues, but before we move along, a big thank you to our sponsor, ABC Fitness. Discover ABC Ignite gym management software and learn why it's the trusted solution for more than 8,000 clubs and 24 million members. Learn more at abcfitness.com. When it comes to getting people in the doors, one of the biggest factors, gym intimidation comes up a lot. I know laziness can be part of it as well. But I want to know what's the most embarrassing thing that has happened to you in the gym, <laughs> working out, <laughs> throwing something across spandex. the room. Spandex. Yeah. <laughs> there was this time where I wore spandex for a workout. Chris wearing spandex. That was a lot of stretch. A lot I mean, of stretch. Tr truthfully, I did wear spandex. I dressed up as Buddy the Elf for a campaign once that we called Mary Fitness. Those are some and, snug uh, yellow tights. I was running on a treadmill with great speed using Bill's superpower. Uh, no throwing, but there was a lot of members that were watching and intrigued by this filming of me dressed up as Buddy the Elf uh, wearing yellow tights. So that was one that uh, there is video evidence of that that is suppressed heavily on the Internet. But, uh, yeah, that was an interesting time. <laughs> a pretty embarrassing moment. Truthfully, was it embarrassing or were you like loving every moment? I, I requested I'm not convinced. that we do it after hours. Truthfully, and then they're like, "No, it'll be the the, the the cost of the shoot will double, the photographer double." And I'm like, "Man, <laughs> middle of the day, brutal." But we did it. We had some fun. I'm like, how were they crops? Did it look like you were waiting for a flood? Because spandex, you're looking kind of tall. I'm a little, I'm a little offended. I mean, truth, 
I mean, we really want to get into it. I played a lot of football, right? I played, I played with spandex under all the time. I mean, there might be times in my workouts now where I may wear a legging or two. I mean, let's just be honest. So next I, it's time a we do cold. this, it's a the bit panel, cold the rule is Canada. spandex. <laughs> the next time we do this, everyone's in spandex? Yes. Uh, I won't be back. But anyway. <laughs> How about yourself, Mark? I'm trying to think what's an embarrassing moment in a gym. Um, I don't know. It's a tough one. I can't think of anything where I was super embarrassed. You have had so much better luck than I have. Yeah. I've come off of benches. Like, yeah, like, and Bill so for mine, sure was, like... mine was, uh, it was a couple years ago, t- attempting to text on a treadmill. Mm. Don't do that. And I lost my balance and I flew off and I actually put a hole in the wall behind me. Oh my gosh. I, I was, it was quite embarrassing. I, I, I fortunately wasn't, uh, I wasn't hurt, but uh, I was, I'm not sure I ever went back to that gym. That might've been a gym, a membership I dropped. I was, so <laughs> was, I was like, was this gym, like, were they a client of yours? <laughs> no, I wasn't. In, I was, it, was a actually just, it was actually, actually just prior to joining ABC. I've so. had on like an in-store camera video that yeah. we could post out there. Yeah, but I don't text yeah. on the treadmill anymore lesson learned lesson learned yeah no mine have always been generally around laundry static cling and all of a sudden you realize that you've been wearing an additional piece of clothing you were not intending not very fun but uh for the three of you i'm so appreciative of your time today coming together and joining me are there any lasting comments that you want to share from our discussion today well thank you first first and foremost the opportunity to have this conversation i think in keeping with what we said earlier just the opportunity to promote the benefits of what the fitness industry is all about and, um, and and get that message out to as many people as possible. I, I just applaud your efforts in, in trying to help us do that. So thank you. Yeah, I'd say the same thing. Thanks. It was great to be here. Spent time with Bill and Chris, of course, and yourself. But again, we're all about movement, exercise, wellness, and whether you're doing it in a park or at home, in the garage with a friend, or at Fitness World in BC, get out there and get moving. That's what we're all about. You know, we're all about health and wellness, and, and it's really important to us that we get that message out as much as we can to spark people to get back to a daily regime. And it's nothing better than the endorphins flowing and your body feeling great. It helps mental health. It helps your physical health. It helps your social health, everything you can possibly think of. Um, it's the greatest thing in the world, and, and people that do it know it, and the people that have done it know it, and the people that haven't done it need to know it. So. I would just say, let's get after it. Beautifully said. Yeah, I would just say if people are, you know, watching, listening, whatever, I would say, you know, hopefully if you're not as active or involved specifically from an industry perspective, like you're in the industry, you're listening to this and you think there's an opportunity for you to do more to help, um, you know, from a state level, whatever else that you can do to get involved, to help move the industry forward, you know, please do so, right? Put that passion into action um, because that's really what's required. No, I appreciate it so much. And just kind of leaping off your sentiments there. You know, my background wasn't the fitness industry, and it's an industry that I entered about a year ago after being a devout enthusiast because all of what you said is something I believe so wholeheartedly. But what has impressed me the most after having a TV career where you're interviewing people from all walks of life every single day for yourselves everyone in this upper level of the industry actually practices what they preach. You're in it because you genuinely do believe it. As I mentioned, we were recording here and thank you to the Fitness Technology Summit and Al and Tara for providing this space. But I mean, I saw you there 5 a.m. on the first day and I was thinking, naively, oh, I'm going to have the hotel gym to myself, get my workout in before my day was started. And it was packed. And it was because it was everyone here. And I think that that is what's so impressive because you all know it so inherently. Granted, it may be a long journey to get the bill passed there, but what I do know is that unified voice and these voices coming together, whether you're a big box right down to boutique, the movement is happening, the narrative is shifting, it's translating to members down the line through our social platforms. So keep going, keep doing what you're doing, and thank you so much for using your expertise to provide more insight on our very first fitness forecast. You've just listened to All Things Fitness and Wellness, hosted by Chrissy Van. This episode was brought to you by ABC Fitness. With more than 31,000 clubs and studios, 542,000 coaches and trainers, and 38 million members in over 100 countries, ABC Fitness is the fit tech provider to the best in fitness. Visit them at abcfitness.com. 
Be sure to hit like and subscribe. We have weekly podcast episodes featuring industry thought leaders and fitfluencers. We're on a mission for everyone to live a life fit and well.